G'day guys, welcome back to another True Footy podcast. One I'm pretty excited about today, talking to the brothers that make up footy A to Z. Of course, these boys started on YouTube towards the back end of 2019 and enjoyed a meteoric rise for good reason during 2020 to have over 11,000 subscribers. I got the boys on the podcast to discuss the AFL season in general this year, their thoughts on rule changes, and of course, being Richmond fans, they had plenty to say about what's going on at Punt Road as well. Then we talk a little bit about YouTube. YouTube and how their channel is going for them in 2021. But before we get into the podcast, I do need to bring you a message from today's sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is here to provide you with the best tools for your grooming experience, offering precision engineered tools for your family jewels. The Lawn Mower 3.0 Trimmer is the best hygiene tool for the modern man. Because of this ceramic blade and advanced skin safe technology, you can kiss goodbye to the snags on your nuts. That was a gross choice of words. The trimmer is also waterproof, so you can take it into the shower with you to get the job done. Manscaped's performance package is the best buy of 2021. The whole performance package comes with a new and improved Lawn Mower 3.0, as I alluded to, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Trimmer, the Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag. Have you ever noticed just how nasty nose and ear hair is? Well, in fact, 79% of partners polled admitted that they find long nose hair a major turnoff. The bundle also comes with the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Proviver Ball Toner. The Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant that makes your balls feel nice and as though they're walking on a winter wonderland this July. The Crop Reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls. It's made with soothing aloe and witch hazel extracts that make your balls look up at you and say, Thank you. Don't get cold feet this winter. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com if you use our discount code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word. They have a ton of other amazing men's hygiene products and their website, including a disposable mat for your pubes and also foot deodorant. Come on, guys. Some of you out there need foot deodorant. So remember, guys, go to the website manscaped.com and you can get 20% off their elite products and free shipping by using the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word. Thank you, Manscaped, for making our winter wieners look good. Let's get into the podcast. All right, g'day, guys. Welcome back to the True Footy Podcast. First one we've done in a little while, but it's a special one. We've got two very special guests returning to the show uh, on their second appearance, but uh, there's a chance you might not have heard of them back uh, in True Footy Podcast 53, because that was early days in their channel. But if uh, if you're a watcher of AFL YouTube and you don't know these guys by now, um, you're certainly missing out. I've got Zach and Andreas from Footy A to Z. How are you, boys? Good, thanks, Jesse. It's good to be back on the show once again. Yeah, been looking forward to uh, coming back on, so pumped to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you, boys. Yeah, uh, particularly... Um, you guys are obviously Richmond fans, and um, I do want to get your thoughts on that because, as far as I know, I don't know if there's any other Richmond content creators out there making a lot of Richmond content. But uh, yeah, I know yeah, you guys sort so. of, yeah. No, I think I think it's you guys. Uh, even though your channel is obviously based around the AFL generally, um, it'd be great to get your thoughts on that. But first of all, um, I just want to know, being based in Melbourne, how good is it to have footy back in the uh, in the motherland? <laughs> yeah, we lots of VFL jokes are made last week. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> By us, it's like it's taken thirty years for the VFL has returned <laughs> with yeah. all the teams in Victoria. That being said, uh, the one game of footy that I've been to since things restarted, we were both at was the Richmond St Kilda game. <laughs> yeah, it was mixed emotions and just a strange feeling. I was like, I kept on almost forgetting whether I was at Marvel or the MCG just because we were sitting in different seats to usual, and I kind of felt like a fish out of water. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a very bittersweet night. We also spent a lot of that night trying to organise players for our own football team, which um, was a, a welcome distraction in the second <laughs> half of the match. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you didn't miss uh, either of the goals then? <laughs> <laughs> no, we saw the first four points we kicked in a row pretty clearly, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. Uh, but, but all in all, a good thing, I think. It's, it's always great to have footy at the MCG. I think good, it's a good spectacle and good for the game. For sure, for sure. And I'm not really one to poke too much fun. My club is uh, probably even worse at the moment, um, the West Coast Eagles. But uh, uh, so did you say that was the first game you've been to since the pandemic started? First game since we had our little lockdown. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Two-week lockdown. Um, oh, okay. We've been to a few games this year. We were at the Sydney game as well, which was awesome. Oh, right. much fun. oh my God. Um, <laughs> Have you been to a win yet? <laughs> yeah. But the Sydney yeah. game was the first loss we'd actually been to. Dad and I were at the GWS time. game. Mm. 
we're one of the few Richmond supporters who made the trek to Marvel Stadium. Oh, uh, good one, yeah. That was a good that one. That was good. Yeah, that was that was a good game to be at. Mm. Were we at the Carlton game? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we were. Because they did the flags. Yes, we're at the Carlton game as well. So that was a very nice yeah. moment. Yeah. yeah, it's just weird because we're sitting in different seats again as well because we're reserve seat members, so we normally always sit in the same spot. But because of the, you know, capacity limits and the social distancing at the G, you get moved around all over the place at the moment. Um, yeah, fair enough. Which I guess Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, I, I'm the same. I sit in the same spot every week. And uh, for the finals in 2019, I remember sitting right behind the goal. Uh, goals against Melbourne. Now, shitty seats normally, but thankfully uh, it was a good result that day, so I didn't care too much. <laughs> nah, it's good. But uh, yeah, no, it's good It's good that you guys have football back um, this year because obviously we all know what happened in 2020. You guys missed a lot of the season and it ended up ultimately, uh, you probably would have been a good chance to go to the grand final, I take it, if, uh, if that had been a normal Melbourne grand final. Is that right? So, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Depends, yeah. depends on how lucky we were in the ballot. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There's always that chance. We were unsuccessful in 2017, but were lucky enough to go in 2019. Um, so, I don't know, flip of a coin in a way whether um, we would have been allowed to, but sort of, certainly would have been nice to have the chance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, uh, fingers crossed. I think um, that uh, we get the finals and uh, or part of the finals and the grand final at the MCG this year. In my opinion, um, one thing I want to talk about is uh, rule changes. So, obviously, I haven't spoken to you guys on uh, on the channel since the start of the season, um, and I know that you've made a lot of content in this space. In fact, that you had me on your channel uh, for um, a little video about rule changes. But I want to know your guys' thoughts because you guys are probably the best at sort of analysing this part of the game and uh, I'm keen to hear your opinion. So we've obviously seen a few cha rule changes with, uh, you know, the man on the mark and stuff like that this year. Um, what have you made of it all? Do you think it's sort of brought about a better spectacle? It's a tough question to answer as a Richmond supporter. Um, better <laughs> spectacle overall, I think probably. It's been pretty clear the game has opened up. Um, we've seen key forwards kicking goals. We've seen run and carry. Um, space opening up around the ground. I think it makes use of the wideness of the MCG a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, but, like, in terms of perhaps what we've gotten used to, like high pressure and stuff, which is something that Richmond has built their game around, uh, we've maybe seen that be a little bit harder as teams can clear the congestion quicker than maybe they could in the past. Mm. Yeah, it's been interesting to see, I think how things have played out over the course of the season as well. Um, I think maybe like the first 10 rounds of the year, we definitely saw a bit of a faster style, um, which tends to be the case in general as well. Like we were looking at some data a couple of weeks ago and round one on average, I think is the highest scoring round of the year. The second highest scoring is round 23. Hmm. Uh, and then there's generally a bit of a trend where so it starts off high scoring in round one and then on average it slowly drops off and plateaus by about sort of round four or five um, in most seasons. So there's like, I think, I think a, just like a natural tend as teams get into the season, they play better defensively. Um, so it's yeah, trying to remove that trend from also the, the rule changes and there's like there's so much going on. But um, I think that the stand rules started off seeing – and one thing, like we did a video trying to look at like how play might change as a result of these rules. And the thing we didn't really predict that I think was the biggest change that we saw was it really helped the run from behind where if the man on the mark couldn't move laterally, you could have a player run past, receive a handball. And by the time the man on the mark could move, the player received the handball was already past them. Um, so I think it's helped that quite a lot, whether it's, helped open up those like lateral kicks as much as the AFL wanted it to. I'm not sure, but I think it's definitely helped a team like, like I think the Swans are a great example of, of a team that's benefited from it playing a lot faster than they were in the past this mm. year as well. Um, yeah. As far as the others go, like I think the kick in has kind of gone pretty much as we predicted it would. Yeah. It's just, they can kick it further. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> That's what it was brought in to, uh, to do, and teams are using it like they're kicking less to the pockets, basically. 
Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you score more often. It just means you get the ball out of defense easier. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's a funny one where um, the aesthetic of that uh, at first really bothered me. I was like, this looks weird. It looks so different to AFL. But now that it's been half a season, I'm completely used to it. I don't even really notice it anymore when uh, when the player takes a massively long kick out. It just seems to be pretty normal. That's really interesting what you said about the high scoring in rounds 1 and 23. And that's why it's great having you guys on the channel because you pluck like research like that out, <laughs> which, is, which is really good. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, I can understand round one because, you know, there's a uh, with uh, everyone on a 0-0 ledger, you could, it makes sense to be playing some more open footy, uh, maybe a little bit less conservative. But round 23 is interesting. I wonder if it's just because teams are playing for finals. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think one thing we had maybe hinted at, like without actually having a proper look it was more of just a theory or a hypothesis if we're going to be you know statistical and proper about it um which we like to be yeah. <laughs> uh yeah is that um by round 23 you often have the good teams of the good teams and the bad teams of the bad teams and you might also get a lot of blowouts um yeah. i think a lot of the top four teams have convincing wins if they come up against a bad team around 23 there's dead rubbers as well like if you know you're not going to mm-hmm. make the finals you know you, you play some kids and give them a chance and yeah i think you see a lot of blowouts yeah that's a good call that's a good point and uh, that would make sense if there's percentage on the line as well uh in the final round pre-buy and also teams wanted to prime but yeah no that's outstanding research i love that um, we'll move on a little bit to some maybe some current events in the football world. Uh, as we record this on uh, on Thursday afternoon, uh, it was it came out yesterday that Clarkson, the champion coach of Hawthorne, is uh, is stepping aside at the end of the 2022 season, um, and he's going to be take it's going to be uh, succeeded by Sam Mitchell. Now, there's a lot of criticism. Well, at least from Robbo, who we know is an absolute football genius, um, <laughs> but uh, but among others. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. He he and others have criticised it for perhaps being a little bit hasty because it seems like maybe Clarkson was uh, not maybe not unlike Mouldhouse a decade or so ago, maybe not fully open to it happening, or maybe he was forced into it more than is being suggested. So, what do you guys think of that transition happening? Yeah, it's an interesting one, um, especially. I think it kind of came as a surprise given like the rhetoric that had been coming out of Hawthorne all year was kind of you know like. We're not going to do a succession plan. We're going to, you know, back Clarko in for as long as he wants to be here kind of thing. Um, so it seemed to be like a bit of a 180 um, from the, the Hawks' perspective. Mm. That being said, like, I don't necessarily think it's that bad a decision. No. Like, Clarkson has been coached for a very long time of Hawthorne. Um, I, there was, I read an article as well about something that times quite well for his family. Like, if that's just where his priorities are at, maybe it just works well for that, for all parties. Sam Mitchell has um, built a pretty good resume in the VFL. Um, it kind of makes you think that maybe you should have stuck around at West Coast for a little bit longer just to keep that portfolio a bit more diverse. Yeah. Um, but I think Clarkson knows him very well. They've had a good relationship as player and coach and now player and uh, coach and assistant. Yeah. Um, like... If this is how the Clarkson era does end, it, like it, it does make sense to me. He's mm. coaching pretty well at Box Hill as well at the moment. Like I think Box Hill were, were maybe third in the VFL. Yeah, right. So when you look at you know how their their senior team is not doing very well, but their reserves are still playing quite well. Um, obviously Mitchell's doing something right, and it also means that like he's coached a lot of the players already. Um. So it'll be, it won't be necessarily someone coming in from scratch. It'll be someone who has worked with these, this group of players for a while um, by the time he takes over. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a bit of a less of a learning curve for him as such because uh, he would have been with the group for much longer. I'm a huge rap for Sam Mitchell as a coach, being a West Coast fan. Pretty much the one year uh, that he spent in entirety at the Eagles was the year we won the flag. And there's a lot of people that sort of give him a lot of credit for his role as a midfield coach because that seems to be the one year our midfield actually had balls. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think he's he seems like a really smart guy. And it's always, in my opinion, the coaches that are 
likely to do better are the ones that maybe didn't have to rely on uh, natural ability and athleticism. But because uh, you could say Sam Mitchell didn't really have, wasn't really blessed in that sense. But uh, he was obviously a, a bit of a master of the game. Um, and yeah, I can understand how how he'd be a great educator. So I think the replacement makes sense. But I think the other argument is that. Um, it's just a risk when you sort of offload a coach who's arguably one of the greatest coaches of the modern era, well, certainly one of the greatest coaches of the modern era and maybe all time, um, to offload him. But then the other side of that is it's a different motivation for a cloak like uh, Clarkson to try and rebuild again. It's one thing to keep going if your team's in the window. And I, I do suspect as well that maybe this Hawthorne rebuild hasn't gone to plan. When you look at trades for guys like Tom Mitchell, Chad Wingard, Jager O'Meara, they, this was meant to be happened a little bit differently uh, than it has. So um, I do wonder if uh, that's probably, yeah, I think it may be a bit of um, fatigue for Clarkson perhaps, and I wouldn't be surprised if he does coach elsewhere. Do you think there's any chance he comes back in a couple of years for a Carlton or whoever? I'd be very surprised if he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It was like a story that came out yesterday as well that North tried to poach him mm. recently. Um, Add that to the list. <laughs> I mean, North, yeah, seemed to try to poach everyone. Yeah. <laughs> there was an article the other day saying they're preparing a bid for Josh Kelly again. And I was like, haven't we yeah. already had this plot line? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just getting lazy writing now. Um, yeah, that's true. But, yeah, I'd be surprised if he doesn't come back. I definitely see him maybe want to take a, a couple of years off, spend some time with his family, all that sort of stuff. And he's definitely mm. earned it. Yeah, um, but someone, yeah, with his footy sense, I think it would be um, strange. At, at least if we don't see him somewhere in the football world again very soon. Yeah, yeah. even something like a, a Neil Baum like role at a yeah, at a club or Mark or something. Williams yeah. as well as another one who's gone from coaching into more of like a an overseeing kind of role. Yeah, that's a really good call. And let's hope if he does end up at somewhere like Carlton, it doesn't end up like their uh, Mick Malthouse era. <laughs> or do hope, depending on who you go for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's <Jerry>. true. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I guess we can talk about uh, the season in general now. Um, there's been, in my opinion, two clear teams, but maybe not everyone agrees that there's been two clear teams up to this point. But then it's kind of also been, that foundation has been shaken a little bit with Melbourne's dip in recent weeks. I think they've dropped three of the last six against teams that uh, are probably going to be battling to make the eight, if at all. So I was just want to know your thoughts on, based on what you've seen so far this year, guys, who do you think is the best team in the competition? Jeez. Um, the very best. Mm. I think it's hard to say, especially this year, because everyone's been so up and down. Mm. Like, I, I don't think there has been a, a team that has been the standout best team all year. The team is scares me the most i think when they play well is geelong mm, yeah definitely um, some of the footy they played in that game against port away at the adelaide oval was was very very impressive they dismantled richmond in the second half of that game we didn't us. even look close to them um after half time you're right but then you know they went up to the gabber and, and brisbane <laughs> were able to stop them quite easily as well whereas you know you compare and then melbourne were able to stop brisbane quite easily um and also the bulldogs but then have had this, this dip in form. So it's so hard to say. I think if we had to say the, the best team of the year so far, you probably have to say Melbourne, mm. just on balance. But whether they remain the best team, I think, is a different question. It's a big question when it's a team like Melbourne who have been a bit notorious for uh, bottling on expectation a little bit. Um, so not to sideswipe Melbourne too much because I've been talking them up all year as um, my pick as the best team and uh, probably my flag favourite. Obviously, now they've lost top spot and then you do the ladder predictors and it does suddenly look like they're not gar- they're not even guaranteed top four. That's how even the top five race is. There's a, they played Geelong late in the season, I think, in a game yeah. that could very well decide who finishes in the four and who finishes out of the four. And it's at GMHBA at this stage. So that uh, that gets a little iffy. And of course, tonight they're taking on um, the power. So again, our conversation will be a little bit influenced by uh, that result, but or made to look silly perhaps. But uh, do you think, you know, my opinion is probably, I reckon we've got four premiership quality teams uh, in the top four and then there's Port. Do you agree with that? Yeah, Port's a little bit of a wild card. Um, mm. Like, they're definitely a different team at the Adelaide, at the Adelaide Oval. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it does. They do feel like a fifth team that's just outside the top four. Like the ladder feels very kind of apt 
So I think I they it would, but yeah, they have a better um, run home, I think, than teams like Melbourne and Geelong do. So yeah, I, we get a, we're treated by a lot of teams playing each other um, mm. in similar ladder positions in the back half. Of it's the going season. to be a very very good finish to the season, I think, regardless of what happens. But yeah, saying yeah, Port Adelaide, I think, and we've heard this from a few people that we've talked to recently. You know, kind of riding them off, can't win the flag, kind of thing. Um, I think for me, they're definitely the the fifth of the five. Um, if you had to rank them, but I also wouldn't write them off completely. No, nah, definitely not. Um, especially if, if Charlie Dixon can find the form he was in last year again. Um, and is there a chance they'll get Zach Butters back this year? This, this week, week, I think. Right. There you go. So I yeah. think it makes them a completely, I think he makes them a, maybe not a completely different side, but a better side. Mm. Um, yeah. And had possibly a career best couple of games um, before he got injured as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. He was in career best form. Um, yeah, I love Zach Butters for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, if they can, if they can manage to get a home prelim, like mm. they, you know, somehow manage to steal second, and or if maybe they finish third and someone else falls over and they they get into a home prelim, you can definitely see them doing some damage. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I suppose I should probably amend my question. It did sound like I was writing them off. I don't. I'm not meaning to write them off. What I was trying to suggest with the based on what we've seen, the best four had looked to me like they're all. Premiership quality, and then this year Port Adelaide has been a clear level behind. So I agree with you on that. Certainly, with their run home, uh, there's a good chance they finish top four. So they've got Melbourne tonight, um, potentially an eight point game, and then uh, I think there's another fixture away against GWS where might have previously thought they were going to lose that. Uh, sorry, we're going to win that, and then GWS's form now makes me rethink it. So it really does depend on whether they finish in the top four. But speaking of the finals race in general. Um, I think we've got the six locked in um, with Sydney. Are you guys pretty happy to lock Sydney in? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that means it's... I think they deserve a final spot this year. We were I saying agree. all year we've, like, because we we're talking about how hard the ladder's been to predict when so many teams move around in the ladder. It's mm. like, it's really hard to predict form and, like, when teams are going to drop off. Like, everyone's been asking, when are yeah. Melbourne going to lose games all year? And we've kind of only just been seeing that the last month. Um Sydney, every week we've been like, oh, is this the week Sydney start dropping off? Should we, you know, stop tipping them? Or um, are we going to overtake them back when we were, you know, still in the eight? Yeah. Um, and they just never have. Like, they've really maintained that spot. Mm -hmm. um, dropped the odd game here or there, but also had some really convincing wins um, and looked like a good side. They played the MCG really well uh, when we watched them live. They did, yeah. Um, and just kind of have a lot of the pieces that you need to play well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, unfortunately, this week we saw it a better demonstrated than we have in a few weeks against the West Coast Eagles. Um, yeah, I'm, I must admit, I was the same. I, I was waiting. I thought it was a matter of time before the Eagles and Richmond showed their class above Sydney, um, and now I, I don't feel that way <laughs> based on what we've seen recently. But in terms of 7th and 8th spot, because I think that is quite an interesting uh, chat because there's been so many teams that are on the brink of of sort of establishing themselves in the top eight and then losing an unexpected result, in particular West Coast and Richmond. Um, but you can add GWS to that as well. And then you've got teams that just won't quite go away, even though, in my opinion, they haven't been great, uh, in teams like Fremantle, uh, St Kilda, and uh, believe it or not, Carlton is still only six points out of the eight. So if you had to pick two teams that you think will be there out of uh, out of those teams and, and Essendon as well, uh, who who are you guys vibing and who who do you think will make it? And you can be biased. Um, well, if we play if we play the way we have been, then we won't. Something has to change. Um, I've been pretty adamant about that. Mm -hmm. Like, um, yeah, we we don't seem to have as clear a game plan at the moment as probably some of the teams around us. Um, Essendon are really building their craft a lot more, um, but them and Fremantle will have a significantly harder run home than Richmond and GWS. Yeah. Um, so based off that logic. I think Freo's loss to Carlton pretty much writes them out of it unless they can, can find something inspirational and go on a ridiculous run. Mm -hmm. um, same with the Saints, I think. I think their run home is also quite difficult. So I think it's it's really going to be um, Richmond if they get their act together, the Eagles and the Giants. Yeah. Um, based on what we're seeing at the moment, I'd, I'd probably go with West Coast and GWS. Really? Yeah. Um, but... <laughs> but We've been saying all year we don't think GWS is that great a side. That yeah. Yeah. Um, then they beat the top of the table at their home deck and 
and then the Eagles and Richmond have results like they did, and it's it's harder to be confident. Mm. There's a game in round, so we play the Giants in Sydney in round 22, which yes. is the US. Mm. Um, and in we were kind of playing around with the ladder predictor a bit earlier yep. as well. In most of the scenarios that we did, that game will decide who finish eight, who finishes eighth. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Uh, I feel like that's a fixture the Giants generally win, or at least do pretty well in. If uh, maybe yeah, if they, wrong, they, but, they've had yeah. a good record over us up there the last yeah. year, um, and pushed us in Melbourne earlier in the season as well. Of course, in a game yeah. they probably should have won, to be honest. Um, yeah, Dustin Martin turning it on in the last quarter. That's true. Kind That's of, true. Well, the second half kind of managed to yeah. to drag us over the line, but it's going to be it's going to be very exciting either way. I think the race for the top four is is going to go down to the wire. The race for for seventh and eighth is going to go down to the wire. Um, and I think the for, from an Eagles perspective, I think this week's game against North Melbourne is also shaping up to be a blockbuster. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't really shown an ability to put teams away this year, unlike previous years. And um, people, you know, come back to the flat track bully thing, which is probably pretty valid at the moment. But I don't think we've even been battering the teams we're expected to batter, to be honest. We've kind of stolen results, not stolen results, just, um, but we kind of gotten, a, gotten by on being so potent in the forward line and making most of less opportunities. Um I don't think we're going to smack North Melbourne at all. And it's going to be wet and uh, we're out of form. I think it's I think it's going to be a three goal win, but you're right that it is important with a percentage of ninety five um, that we make the most of a win if we do get one. But let's talk about how much your club sucks. <laughs> um, uh, uh, in your opinion, how bad is it at Richmond at the moment? They're they're kind of saturating the media a little bit because you know is the dynasty over is a hot question. Um, how bad do you think it is? What are you guys making of it? It hasn't been been great the last two weeks. Um, St Kilda was one of the worst games I think we've seen us play for a while and and gold coast was not much better like we should have lost that game by 10 goals yeah mm. uh it was just you know bad kicking from the suns kept us in it yeah we were laughing like how have we kicked more goals than them in the third quarter and <laughs> even though we were still losing it was like eight goals to nine or something yeah and it's just, <laughs> like could not believe um just how out of the game it felt like we were but you know Took Miller seemed to be getting contested possessions at will pretty much as well. Mm-hmm. Like like whenever he went near the footy, if he wanted to get it, he'd just get it. And we didn't seem to have any way of stopping him. Um, I think, yeah, as undermanned as we've been this season as well, there's, it's, it's meant that we haven't been able to get much consistency with that midfield group. There's constantly been players coming in and out and in and out of it. So I think that starts to take its toll after a while too. Um, so, yeah, around the footy, we just, just don't seem to have much contested drive. But that traditionally hasn't been an issue for us, which is the worry. Yeah, we've um, been allowed to rely heavily on our defence in the past. Um, and even before we had, you know, significant injuries to Broad, Bolter, um, hooley has been in, out, in and out of the side a lot. And the Bloston, same with Nick Vlosten. Well, a lot of footy. Um, I think Richmond's defence has really been built on just being so well set up um, and so well, like, just how well gelled it is together. And I think an effect of uh, the the play just moving end-to-end quicker is that our defence isn't always set up as well as it has been in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, like, Nick Vloston, one of the best readers of the game, intercept players, known for leaving his man and helping players, is often just seem to be a meter or two off, you know, a spare man or he's lost his man at the back and they just don't have time to either play that come forward defense style play um, or, you know, still get back to their own man if they miss it. Yeah. Um, and I think that has had a pretty large impact on our ability to then win the ball back and launch our slingshot. Yeah. So previously we, we would rely if it was almost like if we won contested possessions, that was seen as a bonus. Mm. Um, and we, we set up as if we were going to lose them and then rebound off half back and then slingshot forward. So, you know, if we won the clearance, great bonus. If we lose it, we're just going to get the ball back anyway and go the other way. Now that that defense is not working as well as it has in the past, 
that those issues around the ball are starting to get exposed a lot mm. more as well. Um, and we haven't even talked about the forward line yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's some um, there's some parallels there between our clubs in the sense that uh, we probably set up to lose a contested ball, as we so often do. Um, and we try and transition from the back half, but unfortunately we just do it very, very poorly. I think we're even ranked 18 for transition from the D50 to the forward 50 as well. So yeah, and enough about that, but it's just an interesting observation. So, cause, cause I look at Richmond and I think you guys have had adver- adversity the last two years, you know, um, particularly in injuries. So it doesn't make sense to me that it's simply personnel dropping off, but sometimes what can happen is, you know, personnel out and then maybe a couple of bad re- uh, results leads to lack of confidence and when there's when there's a lack of confidence then things dry up so are you guys pretty confident that you a, a few tweaks could fix it i know it's an impossible question to answer but you guys still have that faith as fans i still have faith that we can make the finals yeah this year for sure yeah i think hardwick has shown an ability in the past to be able to fix things um whether or not it's it's all too much this time around. I think sides have figured us out a bit more as well, which you often see which good, with good teams. You know, they have a run of, of three or four years and then they lose a couple of games and all of a sudden sides realise how to play against them. Um, 100%. Which, yeah, I think is something that Sydney did really well against us. They, they won the contested ball, they held onto the footy and they moved forward in a way that basically just kind of nullified our defensive setup. And I think a lot of teams have looked at that um and seeing you know kind of that that we're beatable basically Mm. um but i I still have faith if we lose to collingwood all that faith will be gone Um, (laughs) but yeah Yeah, it it is still there and if um especially now that lynch is back as well i know a lot of people like to to rag on tom lynch but i think he's quite an important player for us which we saw against the suns as well he almost single-handedly kept us in the game yeah that's very true definitely he helped make the game look closer than it was yeah, that's true. Um, so I guess there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of hyperbole, a little bit, and a lot of um, what's the word? Just uh, people wanting to sort of write the dynasty off as such. But I guess even just looking past this year, do you guys? How long do you guys think this window could last as things currently stand? Assuming that you know Richmond aren't completely dead. Let's say there is fight in them. But in terms of, I guess, your list profile, um, do you feel like the next year and the year after that, Richmond is still a shot? I think it's going to come down a lot to this this year's, well, the, the next draft, mm. um, which we have a strong hand in. We've kind of strategically um, piled up some picks for this draft. Uh, if those picks aren't used well, then um, I think that could spell a very awkward transitional phase um, sure. for a couple of years. Mm. If we hit, like, I think if we get a couple of players who can come in and make an impact and, you know, you don't really want to be relying on a couple of 18-year-olds to be the difference between finishing, say, ninth or eighth and For sure. um, then getting back into the top four. But um, I think we've seen an injection of youth and um, good skilled players this year it has been very important for sides like Sydney. Mm. Um Fremantle as well, their young players, like their improvement has come from those kinds of attributes. So if we were uh, to, you know, go down swinging and um, not win the premiership this year, then I'd, I would like to say that it isn't dynasty over. Like we did miss 18. Um, it just depends on how long, like how long do you give Richmond to get back afterwards um, to still count as a dynasty and right. it's a long or one, whether it's like five and three years Richmond and um, second. <laughs> that's kind of debated or whether it's, you know, it starts becoming its own thing, whether it's mm. two or three years down the track. Yeah. I mean, it's only, you go back, what, like a month ago and it seemed to be all the media wanted to talk about was how are Richmond going to keep all their good players <laughs> um, with, you know, guys like Bolton coming through and um, Coleman Jones and, and all that sort of stuff. I like. I think. I think Cal- Callum Coleman Jones is really exciting. Um, I think it will make a good replacement for Rewalt long term if we can if we can keep him in the side. If and if we can can lock in Shy Bolton on a long term contract, I think he is the best player that we have at the moment. Um, wow. Just in terms of like raw, in terms of his potential, like sure. um, in terms of just the raw talent he has and the yeah. things that the he things can do. you see him do is just. 
stupid. Like, it's Dustin Martin like, but just in a different kind of style of player. You know, it's um, yeah. And we're saying he reminds us a lot of of Shane Edwards early in his career, who these days is a very clean, very silky player, but in his first few seasons struggled a bit. Like he turned the ball over. He didn't quite have like the, he wasn't just the clarity perhaps. Yeah. Like the rhythm and the speed at which AFL football is played. He hadn't really adjusted to yet. But sure. then after he'd been in, and it would be quite frustrating to watch him at times. Cause you felt like he was yeah, like turning the ball over and, and not that, not having as good a game as he could, but you could see the potential in him. And I feel like, Bolton is the same as that, but better. Yeah, he's a special player for sure, and one that uh, I haven't completely given up on hope on uh, luring home to WA, although I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But um, you, you kind of touched on it there, but uh, I was wondering your guys' thoughts on the balance of, uh, naturally at Richmond, you've got um, some older players coming to the end of the careers. Uh, you have Cochins, you have Rewilds, you have Edwards, you have Hoolies, um, probably gone in the next two years. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but there's naturally going to be a transition, right? So what are your thoughts on using the picks that you have um, in terms of trying to secure some established players like an Adam Chera from Fremantle just immediately comes to mind. Um, Tom Mitchell was mooted, but I don't think there's actually much happening there. Um, do, do you guys think you could follow the route of going established players to sort of prolong it, or do you want to hit the draft? I think we've got enough picks that we can almost do a little bit of both Yeah, at this point. Um, it, the only thing with that is that it, it does then put a lot more pressure on the picks that you choose to keep. Yeah, does that's that true. make sense? Like, yeah, if we, yeah, yeah we have like I think we have four quite good picks coming into this draft. Would you then maybe say if we use all four of those in the draft, then we're pretty likely to get at least one good player back? But maybe if we trade two of them out and use two of them, then we're then we're kind of making a bit of a riskier approach. But I I would would tend to say that if we can wrestle free someone like a Chera, then we should go for it. Um, for the right price, of course. For the right just, price, yeah. Um, yeah. We're not going to pay 800000 a year for Zach Williams. Yeah, that's true. And uh, Freeman or do drive a hard bargain for their trades. Pick two for Lucky Weller. Come yeah, to <laughs> yeah, we've got a bit of a history in that department, I guess. Exactly. Um, as long as it's, I think we, if we're going to go for a, a, an established player, I still want them to be on the younger side someone like yeah, Chera, definitely who can then you know obviously boost that midfield but we'll also will get the benefit of him for for a while whereas if we go for someone like Mitchell then maybe we get another two or three seasons out of him I don't think that's as worthwhile yeah nice one um I guess talking about dynasties in general um let's as we've kind of seen like there seems to be a trend in the AFL where there will be a period of dominance for one team uh, with a few exceptions in between where flags are pinched. You've got you know, but you had Brisbane, um, obviously in the early 2000s, and then there was a gap, and then Geelong kind of took over, and there was teams that pinched flags in between, but I think Geelong was still, that was their dynasty, followed by Hawthorne, and then Richmond was obviously the heir apparent to that um, in terms of pure dominance. But is there a team that if you had to nominate to succeed Richmond, at the moment, based on uh, we've talked about, you know, teams for a premiership this year, but um, assuming it can't be Richmond, is there a team out there with the list profile that you look at and go, I could see this team being very good for a number of years? It's a good question. Do you have any strong thoughts? I think this year is is kind of like who wants to be that team. I think Geelong. Mm. I don't know. It's kind of like we were saying about Sydney. We keep waiting for them to drop off. Geelong. It's like that year to year. Um, you'd think. Surely they're not about to launch a dynasty. They're kind of going for that one you can pinch. Yeah. But say you have Melbourne, uh, Brisbane, and the West, the Western Bulldogs and Port. Mm-hmm. It's like if you want to be that next team, win this year. Um, yeah. That platform. Yeah. Like it's it's so hard to say who could be like I would say. Yeah, I think whoever wins this year, if it's not Geelong and it's one of those other four teams, yeah. they're like they have first grabs on doing it mm. um, in terms of actually thinking who, who like predicting who it actually could be. Um, I think there's a, I see a lot of similarities yeah. between uh, the Western Bulldogs and the Hawthorne dynasty that just went by in that they managed to maybe pinch that one premiership before they were actually ready to. Yeah. Like that OC, that OA yeah, yeah. Hawthorne premiership. Just, you know, all the players were there and they just happened to put it together maybe before 
everyone expected them to. They drop off a little bit, a few more years go by, that same group of players kind of gets more time to develop and gel together and then they go again. Um, but also two very overturned sides as well. There was a, a huge difference between the 2013, that's Hawthorne's first premiership, isn't it? Yeah. 2015 <laughs> yeah. and 2018. Um, and there's actually quite a big difference between Western Bulldogs as yeah. well with just some of the cores sticking around. The cores kind of stuck around and they sort of supplemented yeah. it from there. Yeah. Um, I think the Bulldogs have a great list, though. So deep. And we're, we're going to see their number one draft pick this this week. We haven't even... <laughs> Uh, they haven't even had to, to put out on the field yet, so a mm. scary prospect. And supposedly Darcy is touted as a top pick as well. We could go yeah, that's true. They could they could snag another draft boon there. Yeah, um, sneak. sneak well, I don't know what they're going to do with all their forwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they've got to turn one of them into a backman probably, because if there's one yeah. part of the field where they're maybe a little bit weaker, it'd be that. Um, yeah, I'd say them or Brisbane would be my my answer. The Bulldogs yeah, or the Lions. I was thinking Brisbane. Yeah also mm-hmm. have quite a young list. I don't necessarily rule Melbourne out of that conversation for any reason other than that they're Melbourne, and I'm just not convinced by them, yeah. just based off everything that's happened before. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are all... I think you summed up my thoughts perfectly. I think the three that you nominate as the most potential are the, the Ds, Dogs, and Lions. Um, you also mentioned Port Adelaide there. I do... I don't know if I'm talking shit here, but I kind of feel like an interstate club ruling a dynasty for four or five years, it's a little bit harder. Um, uh, Brisbane was obviously the massive exception to that, but um, that is my one concern with the Lions and power, you know, winning multiple grand finals in Melbourne, for instance. But in terms of list profile, I think the one that you've hit the ha- nail on the head there is is the dogs. And the reason being is because and, and Melbourne's similar, but... Not to the same extent to the dogs where so many of their best players are still in their prime or at the start of their prime. Um, and then you've got all the, the youth on there as well. So Norton's in his like third year, fourth year, max. Yeah, something stupid. And he's, you know, one of the, not one of the best key forwards, but you can tell he's sort of projecting that way. Um, Ugal Hagen, as you touched on there, hasn't played a game yet. Sam Darcy in this year's draft. Uh, and then, you know, we've got Josh Dunkley on the sidelines. I think Troll Law's out at the moment, isn't he? Um, there's so much potential there and, yeah, and, and Bonson Pelly is only 26 years old and, in my opinion, is the best player in the competition right now. So if anyone's set up for a long uh, stint at the top, it's the Dogs. And like you say, with one flag already under their belt, they, they might even be able to just, if they if they do this for a number of years, they can sort of tack on 16 as part of this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how, how Hawthorne supporters feel about that as well. Like, do they claim that that 08 one is part of the... Mm. The repeat, or is it something completely separate? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point. I think they missed the finals once. Sorry, Zach. I was going to say the Brisbane one's interesting as well. Like you said, um, it is harder for interstate teams, and um, it was just like a little side side note. There were a lot of blocked mergers um, by the other clubs between Fitzroy um, and whoever. They Fitzroy just about got linked to anyone <laughs> and everyone yeah. um, for a while, based off the theory that it would just create a super club um and yeah, right. you know just a couple of years after they merged with the brisbane bears they went on to have a three pay so um, <laughs> that is also another kind of contributing reason yeah that's a good point that's a good point cool that's so um we've talked a lot about footy so far but um i also kind of want to talk about you guys um and your youtube journey so far because this uh this is probably one of the more interesting uh, in terms of the trajectory that you guys have been on so as i I said at the start of the pod you you um i think you guys started up around late 2019 if i'm not mistaken i think that's when we first started talking Uh, you did that 2019 grand final preview uh, and that was early days. And, and like myself, you guys started your channel at the end of a season. <laughs> so um, obviously run into the um, the uh, unfortunate hurdle of no more football to talk about. But you guys sort of plied your trade and uh, you got better, honed your craft, still made videos through 2020. And then you kind of... I would say we're making great content, not getting the views that you deserve, which is very uh, common for channels that are early in their journey. But... There was one video in particular um, that you made and it was the super flood the night the AFL changed forever. And it's sitting on about 120,000 views, which is uh, Caden (laughs) (laughs) McDonald-like. And for you guys, obviously, I think your previous best must have been in the 
the few thousands correct me if i'm wrong so so take me take me through what that was like going from uh you know less than a thousand subscribers to i think you said it you guys hit about seven thousand all in the same week what was that like it was crazy yeah, yeah. the super flight itself was a slow burn at first it was like it was probably tracking like in the one or two out of ten um like it was doing well but still at the level that our videos had been um and not sure whether it's related or not but out of nowhere we kind of just decided we'd do a little video with us actually and release it like exactly a week after the super flood so we uploaded again and pretty much from that point i don't know if youtube was just like thanks for uploading regularly for once in your life (laughs) the views just started going from there um on a crazy upwards trajectory um yeah wow and we were just I don't know. We would basically just sit there watching the analytics going, what the hell is going on? What is this? Like, yeah. didn't really know exactly how to deal with it. We we lucked out a little bit as well in that just purely by coincidence, because um, we'd had this video, the Superfly video was like on our list for a while and we, you know, did the videos before it and we got finally got down to it and we're like, all right, time to make this video. We are working on it for maybe about a week and mm. we realised two weeks from now, Essendon and the Bulldogs play each other. So if we can have the video done before then, then maybe it'll be almost kind of like a preview sort of thing. And I think awesome. what well, we re- we released it maybe like on the Thursday, same day, same day we released it. I'm pretty sure or the Friday. Yeah. Um, and it was doing you know as well as our videos had done in the past, if not maybe just a tiny bit better. And we were like, oh cool, like the plan worked. We've got a little boost. And then I think the weekend finished, and and maybe you know people going to the highlights video. Um as well just kind of like getting that that traffic through but yeah it was crazy like if you look at the spike on our channel in terms of like our, our total views it goes from like we're getting maybe maximum like a thousand views a day if we release a really popular video to all of a sudden we get like seventy thousand views in one day mm. and we're like what we'll have to grab you a picture to chug because it's, <laughs> it's like it's a strange shaped graph uh, That's awesome. the other thing though that, that helped was that um, like that video definitely drove it, but our other video, which um, who owns the AFL clubs, kind of went along with it. Yeah. Um, so that video, I think now is is sitting on on over fifty thousand views as well. It's our second most watched video. Wow. Um, so then those two almost kind of started feeding each other. I think in a way, um, it was it was pretty funny. I, I talked to a few friends who um, had just had the videos like pop up on YouTube just randomly seeing it. They're like, oh, it's an interesting video. And they get halfway through it and they're like, voice sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it was, it was actually, I think I voiced the clubs one maybe and you voiced the super flood one. Or it would be the GWS Gold Coast you voice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Zach does a voice on most of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, then messaging me being like, hey, I just randomly happened to watch one of your videos on YouTube and I wasn't even looking for it. <laughs> did they know you did YouTube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they knew it yeah. was like a thing that we did. They'd seen us like post about it before, but hadn't really sure. paid that much attention. And they were like, oh, this is actually yeah. kind of cool. So that was fun. I think you told me a good one. Like your mate's brother was watching one and he came in and like yeah, yeah. brother didn't have any idea or whatever. One of my friend's little brother's was watching one of our videos. He walked it through and he was like, hey, <laughs> I know the guy that makes those videos. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. And as someone who's been doing YouTube for a few years now, that that story is unheard of. Like one video like that doing so much better. I think you'll understand what I'm saying when I say this, but I feel like that video wasn't so much better than the rest of your content. It was, I feel like you. I've always been an advocate for your content. I think it's all really good. And then it was probably getting under under rewarded for a while, and then it just got not not over rewarded, but just obviously disproportionately viewed. And it, what I think helped you as well is that then when your first video is recommended, like you said, it recommends your other videos, and then thankfully your net your catalog by then was all really good. Um, so you, I mean, it's fair to say you guys have come a long way in terms of quality. Do you guys sort of look back to when you started um, and think, gee? That sucks <laughs> in terms of your own standard. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Definitely. We yeah. have plans. One of the first, so we made, I think we made like three videos because we, we had this theory that if we released three videos at once, it'd be better than just releasing one because people can watch a couple and then subscribe. Thinking um, we were sure. going to get 
thousands and thousands of views as soon as we uploaded our first videos thinking how cool are these um, <laughs> but, yeah one of those was the grand final preview and then we had one on tom mitchell and one on jim steins mm. um and we talk regularly about redoing that jim steins video because we think it's like too good a story and we haven't done a good enough job on the video yeah I can relate to that in that um, I did an Adam Simpson documentary for about 49 minutes. Took about three hours to record that. Um, and by the time I got to the end of it, I was so exhausted. I didn't even care what I was saying. I don't think it didn't, it wasn't really um, conducive to good content. But again, that's another one I look back on and go, wow, I could do that video 10 times better now. Um, but it's, uh, it's amazing how far you guys have come. I guess one thing I do want to ask though, I know you're busy guys because you've got uni, but... Amazingly, you've only made nine videos this season, I think. I don't even know. Yeah, is it We've a only uh, two since the season started? Okay, there you go. Um, we did a lot of pre-season. <laughs> yeah, so I'll ask on behalf of your fans, uh, what's the go, boys? <laughs> we cover a bit of this as well. Like, oh, uh, yeah? Sometimes people will yeah. just comment randomly on our most recent videos. So uh, where are you guys right <laughs> now? Or, um <laughs> People comment stuff like upload schedule is actually fire. And it's like, it's all true, of course. Like, we have a terrible <laughs> upload schedule. Um, I mean, in fairness to you, the workload that goes into your videos is that much higher than um, others, including myself. Um, I've, I've kind of gotten the craft of just banging out quick and easy videos. Um, and that, that served me well. And, and yours do require a lot more time, effort, and research. So I will say that for you. Yeah. It's, it's yes. also, we, we shot ourselves in the foot a little oh. bit um, in that we, I think, bit off a little bit more than we could chew in our, our most recent video. Okay. Oh, there's three videos we've released because we released that podcast as well, I guess, yeah. technically yeah. three. Um, the, Richmond, the Richmond Dynasty video we did, which ended up being 18 minutes long. Mm. So it's not like we weren't working on it. That just took us forever. Yeah, yeah, so long. Um, longer than we thought it would, just in terms of, of research and then all the art and then all the animating. Um, it almost It's almost like it gets increasingly longer to make the longer the video is. For sure. Um, in a way, like it seems like it a snowballs little a little bit. Yeah. Like um, exponential. The text starts to slow down the more things you put in. Uh, like I think that video probably had close to a thousand layers in it. Wow. Yeah, I reckon like by the time you add up all the different pre-comps that are nested within it, um, there's a lot going on mm. in like in like 20 minutes. Yeah, it did very well. Wow, that's the price you pay, I guess, for making actually good content. <laughs> I mean, we're... different content. It's, yeah. It's something though that we are very conscious of and something that we are constantly discussing ideas like how can we be faster? How can we be better yeah. doing this? But... I think we can say that we have plans. We have at least three videos we want to release before the home and away season finishes. Yeah. Or what? Like, do you want to just say what they are? Like, well, it so one of those. So, in, yeah. In production at the moment. It's a little yep. sneak peek for everyone listening to True Footy. Um, <laughs> maybe we should put this up on our Patreon afterwards as well. <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash footy A to Z if you want to support the channel. Um, Good plug. In production at the moment is AFL Explained Taggers. So we nice. haven't done AFL Explained all season. Um, we like doing those. They don't get as many views as our others, but we get a lot of comments on them from people who are new to the game as well, being like, thank you so much for doing this. Like, it's really helped me. Yeah, I get I get questions asking to do uh, like explain videos, and I always just say go to Footy A to Z, A to Z, bro. <laughs> um, and that's yeah, definitely like a library that we just want to grow over time. Till eventually one day we have enough there that someone can you know come to it, watch like all twenty yeah. videos that might be there, and have a, a at least like a base grasp on the game. So that's what's next. Um, a fun one coming up. Yeah, after that, so a script that we're writing at the moment. Um, these these next two probably could be interchangeable depending on how fast we work. Yeah, but, definitely. Because um, one is time sensitive. Um, yeah. We want we we've basically done a, a big statistical analysis on whether free kick differentials make a difference to who win games. Oh, that's sick. Um, yeah, which is interesting. So there's mm. we've made some graphs, we've collected some data. 
Um, yeah. And we're just kind of trying. I think we're searching for like an ending to that video at the moment. Yeah, yeah like just kind of a bit point. of research, seeing where it goes, and yeah. see if there's some kind of narrative we can weave into it as well to make it not just a big stat stump, basically. Yeah, um, yeah, the totally. Task is he has to, you know, present everything in a way in which I can understand it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we know that hopefully the video will make sense. Yeah. So the plan for that is to have a main video, which you can just watch and understand, and then have another video alongside it for those who want a bit of a deeper dive into more of like the mathematical statistical mm. um, framework that we've used. Other than that, we've got a video on showdown as well um, yes. about the race for the first South Australian license and kind of the story surrounding that. That's uh, so cool. that should be hopefully pretty good. Yeah. Um, we want to do the all Australian by the stats again. Um, and the grand final preview as well, of course. Yep. And is, is there any I've missed in there? I don't think so. I mean, we've always um, got ideas in the background. Yeah, but sometimes stuff pops up. Like a lot of the videos just have been, we haven't planned to make it until we start making it, um, which was like the All-Australian last year. So Yeah, so so knock on wood, we'll release five more videos by the time the season finishes. Yeah, love that. No, I'm actually excited hearing that. That's awesome. Do you guys think... Um, being uni students at all that uh, that that plays into helping you write these videos um, and the reason it is because like you just said you need to you can't just simply do a stats dump and go here it is just make of that what you will um, maybe an experience from like report writing you've got to actually come up with a with a, like a thesis point a point that you're trying to make a, a conclusion to the narrative do you think that that helps you guys do what you do yeah definitely I've definitely found a lot because um, I'm studying journalism and media communication. Um, I've had like one of my good tutors has kind of just been like, um, anytime you try to make a claim about anything, they just say, you know, who says kind of or says who kind of thing. Um, and it's just yeah. about having that mindset about like, um, really thinking like, why are you saying, are you just saying it because you're saying it or are you yeah. actually contributing, um, to, you know, the narrative that you're telling the story about here or not, um, and just, you know, lots of bits and pieces and just how to write a good story, structure, using quotes, um, all of that kind of stuff has been really helpful, as well as some software stuff as well. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, I've and like, from my perspective, I've definitely tried to take a lot of the the mathematics and statistics kind of stuff that I've learned and, mm -hmm. and start applying it a little bit more. You can really see the way Andreas's brain is wired from his kind of physics, maths background. Like, although we're not doing stuff that, and less it gets super statistical actually relate to that just the way you kind of logically think and kind of work through cause and effect right. and stuff mm, disproving yeah. proving hypothesis of, well <laughs> i don't even know <laughs> i'm not even going to attempt to say that again <laughs> proving and di disproving and stuff yeah um, yeah it's been really valuable and definitely something i've tried to learn from him as well um, but cool. then on the, the flip side like zach's like all the social media stuff as well that you've learned from your course has also made a big difference. Like, I think another thing that's gotten a lot better on the channel other than the, the content has been the thumbnails and the titles and the descriptions and like all those little things that go into being successful on YouTube. I think we've started to get a lot better at as well. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have a lot of attributes that you, you sort of blend together well, um, which is which is hard to come by and, that, and that's really cool. Um, I kind of have one of my last questions for you is I think I last... I think I asked this on the last podcast and I said, how serious are you guys about making this your career? And I believe that at the time you said you'd never even discussed it, but you have to say it's looking a little bit more realistic than it was when you had like 300 subscribers or whenever we last chatted about it. So um, has that, has that sort of taken any, uh, has it gained any leverage or meterage, so to speak? <laughs> uh, it's a discussion that's on the agenda. Yeah. Still haven't had it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have been talking a lot about growth though yeah, yeah. I think is is yeah something we will say um and what that looks like for the channel i think we haven't had like any concrete haven't made any concrete decisions yet but i think the channel and the footy a to z brand will look slightly different next season to what it is this season cool just in terms of wanting to to kind of yeah start expanding yeah. things a little bit more 
Lovely. That's exciting to hear. Love to hear that. No, that's cool. And I, I think it's one of those things you don't need to force the issue as such. You, you can sort of, you know, put, put the effort in to grow. And then when you see how thick and fast that growth is coming, then you can sort of make a judgment call, you know, how much do I really want to keep investing in this? But um, as someone who, who's pretty much trying to make this a career, I'd be very excited to see you guys, um, you know, continue to take your channel to the next level which is really exciting. Uh, before we go, do you want to, um, for anyone who hasn't heard of you before, tell everyone where they can find you and give everything a little plug? It's your job. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Social <foot> media manager. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, footy A to Z on YouTube, footy space A, the, le- the number. I always say the letter two. Uh, it's a very bad <laughs> habit. It's footy A, the number two Z. Um footy underscore a to z on instagram is the best way to get in touch with us if you want to have a chat about anything or you know send us a advice or anything we also lurk um in the r foot slash afl reddit page uh which i also highly recommend checking out just for a bit of fun if you uh, are struggling to find kind of good places to chat about footy as well yeah so, definitely cool. a community that's helped us grow a lot as well actually um reddit a lot of our early views came from there yeah yeah, nice one. Kind of following, yeah, we built there. Yeah, I'd recommend that um, to anyone sort of trying to do this is to, to uh, utilize things like uh, Reddit and Bigfooty and stuff. That certainly helped me in the early days as well. But uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks so much for your time. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I hope the Eagles play Richmond in the finals now because it means that uh, we'll actually be there, <laughs> which is no longer a guarantee. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time, boys, and good luck for the rest of the season. Cheers, Jesse. Thanks, thanks for having us on. Always good to chat. Yeah, no worries, guys. Catch you soon. See you later.